Hey everybody, Michael Donahue for Ride Monkey Radio. So my first episode of this glorious new year will be about a very real and very meaningful to me uh, relationship that I have with black and white cinema. Uh, a little bit that you may not know about me is I am rather red colorblind. I don't know if you've ever seen the film The Queen of the Damned, the scene in which... Uh, I believe Lestat discovers Akasha in her I'm frozen as a statue place. There's a pool of very deep red blood to my eyes that is black. I uh, I have protonopia, so when I see true red, I see black. And any color that has red in it gives me issue at times, such as depending on the shade of said colors, I will routinely mix up pink and gray or blue and purple or green and brown and uh yeah it's real fun (laughs) but uh, it's neither here nor there recently i've sort of gone down a rabbit hole of uh, black and white cinema now i don't know if any of you were fans of black and white things as a child but uh, i was raised rather conservatively, so Nick at Night was a rather large part of my childhood. Uh, Dobie Gillis was one of my favorite television programs as a small person. (laughs) You know, the classics, uh, I Dream of Jeannie, and my favorite sitcom of all time is actually The Dick Van Dyke Show. If you guys seen any of the the television shows that they, or anything really, movies is something they do it with far too often. They colorize a black and white thing. It's it's just not it's not okay. Any Laurel and Hardy fans out there? Uh, I'm a big fan of March of the Wood Soldiers. It's something entirely ridiculous and awesome and special. And holy of when it was created, it's like 1936 or something. So all the actors are still performing like they're on a stage in a very large theater full of other humans that extend further than they could possibly imagine. They're playing to the back of the theater and the camera's right in their face. So it doesn't work all that well. The truly ridiculous and amazing, terrifying imagery that comes out of this film which, by the way, was the first time they ever filmed Babes in Toyland. It uh, was originally titled Babes in Toyland, but due to this, that, and the other thing, uh, it was later on down the road retitled March of the Wooden Soldiers. And uh, there's some creepy, demonic, nightmare-inducing, in quotes, not Mickey Mouse, little puppet or person in a small costume of some type that's it just skitters and it's disturbing and i don't like it i don't like it at all and then there's the three little pigs and they're supposed to be cute and you know little pig like but instead they look like a trio of murderous people in disgusting horrendous pig masks and the way they move and hang out together, it's just, it's not right. It's not right, people. It's not right, okay? And then way later, the wooden soldiers come c- c- come on, and I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, no, they're cool. They're, they're wooden soldiers. Oh, yeah, I get it. Okay, cool. If you pick up March of the Wooden Soldiers on DVD or Blu-ray, it comes with a now-restored-and-glorious color version, and uh, I threw this on just to see what the differences would be, and oh, my God, it turns nightmare fuel into what can only be described as the nightmare napalm it's oh my god the the the, the three little pigs they, they they look even more like ridiculous costumes and murder masks like it's just not okay it's not okay and the the little mickey mouse thing instead of being acceptably black and white is now bizarrely flesh toned and black it makes zero sense and it it, it it was it was severely uncomfortable and uh, shortly after I picked that up, uh, I uh, I heard about Mad Max Fury Road Black and Chrome Edition, which, if any of you are unfamiliar with, is Mad Max Fury Road mixed in high contrast black and white. When uh, George Miller was making The Road Warrior, he said some of the most striking footage that he had ever seen of the film was when he walked into the room where they were composing the score and the version of the film they were watching was a really cheap sort of just temp black and white version of 
the footage that he had shot, and he was just very taken with the imagery. He wanted to make Fury Road black and white, but we'll get back to that later. Then cut to last year, and they release a little movie called Logan. Now, I could go on at great length about why the X-Men are amazing to me, and why specifically Wolverine is as well. But rather than get intensely long-winded, I'll just give you a little bit of background. When I was like 7 to 11, I subscribed to X-Men comic books. My favorite characters were Nightcrawler and Wolverine. And then shortly after I fall off of the, the comic books a little bit, Along comes the X-Men animated series, or maybe I was, it was concurrent, whatever. <laughs> maybe my time frame's off. But I loved the comic books and the animated series, and then cut to high school, and they start making live-action movies, and this dude, Hugh Jackman, is the perfect guy. Like, just spot-on amazing. Exactly what I would want from the character. But it's also PG-13, so he can't really go full-on crazy berserk like he does and say, okay, hold on, spoilers for the Old Man Logan comic book. Like when he's ripping his way out of the Hulk's stomach, okay? Or, let's say, uh, I think my favorite X-Men comic is X-Men 25. It was in the run where uh, there was the big crossover event, and the way you could follow the books was whichever issue had the holographic card on the cover. Again, spoilers, in this issue of X-Men, Magneto gets to a boiling point and uh, suspends Logan in front of him and rips all the adamantium off of his bones and out of his body. Yeah, that's a thing that happens. You know, it, we're, it's PG-13. We're not getting this crazy nonsense going on. For the next almost, you know, 20 years, this guy plays Wolverine brilliantly in films that range in quality from X2, X-Men United, to... Uh, I really, I shouldn't even say its name. Ah, X-Men Origins Wolverine. How dare you give us the Merc with the mouth and then remove his mouth. Anyway, I also, uh, in high school, acquired this shirt. And at the time I acquired said shirt, it fit me quite, quite nicely. And uh, also got me good and beat up because what's with this nerdy shirt? It's Wolverine? What's a Wolverine? So, you know, I had a couple friends that were like, oh, that thing's really cool. A couple other people were like, ah, oh, Wolverine, right on. But for the most part, it was like, why is this fat kid wearing this stupid shirt? A lot, because believe me, I wore it a lot. But uh, I still have the shirt to this day. Don't believe me? Here's proof. Yes, this is the shirt that I got in high school today. And by today, I mean early 2018, because I don't know when you're listening to this. Wait, how could this shirt possibly be 20 years old? I'm telling you, people. If you wash your shirts in cold water, and you hang dry them instead of sticking them in a washer, you too can maintain this awesome color and brightness. But uh, again, just how colorblind am I? I was completely unaware there were any other characters on this shirt other than Wolverine, until someone pointed it out to me. Now, I can't not see them, but at the time, I had zero idea. Yeah. That's what it's like to beat me. Take a look at this image. It is the logo for the film company Marv, uh, one of the companies that is responsible for bringing you Kingsman to Secret Service. If you have, in quotes, normal eyes, you will be able to see the word Marv quite clearly and have absolutely no idea what I mean when I say I don't see anything but a bunch of dots. Anyways, back on topic. Uh, Logan, when it was released and did crazy well and was very well received by the populace in general. James Mangold, the director, said that he was very taken with some of the photography that was happening on set, which was in black and white. And he was so taken with it that he decided to mix the entire film in high contrast black and white. And when I heard this, I got intensely excited because when people talked about Logan, like one of the first things I said was how amazingly violent and bloody appropriately to the character it was and when i saw the film i was like wow this was a glorious representation of the character that i love it was almost 
everything that I could have possibly wanted out of a Wolverine movie when I was subscribing to the comics when I was a kid. And it almost exclusively took took place at night, so all this bloodshed was utterly lost to my eyes because it was just happening in blackness to me. When I heard that they were going to mix it in high contrast black and white, I was like, wait, 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 what is what does that mean? I don't even know what that means. Well, what it turns out meaning is uh, when I finally picked up Logan on Blu-ray and it came with Logan Noir, I finally got to see it. And I now have the ability to sort of describe what it's kind of like to have eyes like mine. And it's this. So when I saw spoilers for Logan, when I saw Logan in theaters, they rip the tarp away from Caliban to corpse. I sit here looking, I'm like, ugh, well, okay. That's kind of nasty. It's, uh, yeah, bloody and, eh, okay. When I saw the same scene in Logan Noir, I physically recoiled and flew into the back of my chair. So, as it turns out, there's a depth in wounds that is completely lost to, to, to my perception. So, in Logan Noir, I was like, oh my god, no, that's so gross. There's, like, a chunk of his nose missing. Ugh, I just... I had never seen such gory detail. And for some people, they, they they probably can't comprehend what I mean by that, because how could it be gory detail if it's in black and white? Well, it was a level of detail that I had never seen before. So, there you go. So back to Mad Max Fury Road Black and Chrome Edition. When I saw that in theaters, I can't even describe to you how glorious it was to me. The cacophony of practical effects and violence meeting really well-used CG and the sheer love of the art form that goes into the making of this movie made me happy on a very, very deep level. Each faction of... This wasteland has their own kind of color scheme, and it's very cool, and it fits the world. And a lot of colors are very natural, but other colors are just intensely ramped up to a degree that's, like, cartoonish, but works for the film. And I could see where some people would be like, why would you want to strip this movie of this? It makes no sense. But George Miller wanted to make it in black and white. I read a piece that uh, said, you know, he capitulated to make it in color as long as they agreed to release a black and white version on Blu-ray. And then the first run of the Blu-rays come out and it's not there and we're all disappointed. And then of course, down the line, they're gonna double dip and they're like, here comes Mad Max for a black and chrome edition. And I was just annoyed because I naturally just picked up the Blu-ray right a week or two before they announced the Black and Chrome edition. So I could never justify spending the extra cash, but I finally caved and I picked the thing up. And it's, a lot of people talk about it in a lot of different ways. But my take on the on the Black and Chrome edition, other than making someone like myself very happy, the, I think the biggest takeaway for me was I now realize why I have so many headaches. Uh, or at least I feel this way. I first noticed it when I was watching Logan Noir, but I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was while I was watching it, but I felt physically different while watching the film in general. And then, uh, at some point in, in, uh, Fury Road Black and Chrome, I realized that my eyes felt relaxed. What? What does that mean? I don't know how to describe it to you people. Have you ever felt a sudden release of tension that you didn't know you were holding? Imagine this happening in your eyes as opposed to your arms or your thighs, okay? I didn't realize it. Looking at a black and white image, my eyes are very relaxed. And the reason I realized it was as soon as the film ended and I turned it off, there was a moment of not realizing anything had been different and then all of a sudden my eyes going oh no no there's colors again oh and i felt tension but in terms of the film i really feel the black and white adds to the feeling of desolation because while the color schemes all help denote which faction is which when you remove that it just becomes even more desperate even more desolate because everything is just an equal level of uh, pain, of <laughs> assault, of it doesn't matter who looks like what. Everything is after you. So it doesn't matter if it's bright orange, 
dirt red tan of the wasteland it's it, it's all the same and that makes very little sense i just really feel that the black and white when everything looks identical to me the feeling of desperation of desolation of of hopelessness is just is just escalated also when there's less color in the entire world to distract you. I found it a much more character-driven piece than I had in the previous few viewings. Uh, I was less distracted by the world, and I was more concentrated on faces and minutia. Another uh, example of what it's like to beat me, if you've seen Fury Road, spoilers for Fury Road, if you've seen Fury Road, the uh, tornado of flame, that giant what are we driving into shitstorm. Uh, when I saw it in theaters, I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. Look at this swirling death. And oh, there go some cars. There go a couple of people. Yeah. Uh, when I saw it in black and white, I was like, oh, there go all the cars. There go dozens of bodies just being ripped limb from limb in this tornado of fire. Yeah, I certainly didn't see that when it was in color. But man, please, if you get the chance to, please do yourself a favor and check out the movies I'm talking about here. So now cut to, I'm sitting in a theater and I'm watching Guillermo del Toro's The Shape of Water. Okay, I'm not gonna go deep, deep, deep dive into this movie because I could and I might at some point but I need to watch it another two or three dozen times before I'm prepared because it's amazing. But anyway, <laughs> spoilers for The Shape of Water. Serious spoilers. If you're planning on seeing this movie, please don't listen to the next several minutes of this particular podcast. The point at which Sally Hawkins begins to sing to the creature and in her brain... She is performing her heart out exactly like all of the heroes that she would watch on the television in these films, these glorious old Hollywood musicals. This voiceless character suddenly having a voice and her world becomes black and white. It becomes the world of this Hollywood musical style. I almost wept with joy sitting there in the theater because while I can completely understand why certain people wouldn't particularly appreciate the style of this scene, of why would this movie have a musical number at all, let alone a black and white one, it makes perfect sense for this character at this point in her story because of how established it is that she loves these musicals and specifically this song that she sings to the creature. Sitting in the theater in extremely late 2017 and being gifted this gorgeous homage to old black and white Hollywood musicals for someone like myself was just a real, very true and deep joy. This is you know, number 11D and 3 reasons that I need to meet and hug Guillermo del Toro. <laughs> so, um, so there you have it, folks. Some rambling nerdy thoughts from a rambling nerd about black and white cinema. Thank you for choosing to spend your time with me and for tuning in. For Riot Monkey Radio, I am Michael Donahue. Until next time, take care of yourself.